I don't like talking much about accidents or disasters. However, these accidents in railway history, while tragic, offer us an opportunity to learn and make improvements so the lines will be safer. I was reminded of this fact when I came across this in the National Railway Museum's warehouse. It's one of the very few and possibly only surviving piece of wreckage from one of the most severe accidents of the age, the Abbots Ripton incident. The line that ran through Abbots Ripton in 1871 was considered one of the safest routes around. The Great North Railway responsible for the route had an excellent track record with passenger safety and regularly used the line to run the world famous Flying Scotsman, then called the Scotsman's Express. The line also took a lot of slow goods traffic, mainly coal. To avoid the faster passenger trains, the lines had stations along its length, with shunting sidings where the slower trains could go, freeing up the line for the faster trains to pass them safely. All of this was controlled by block signalling by two signalmen, one working at Abbots Ripton and the other working at home. The way that they worked the line was simple. They separated the line into three blocks, each roughly two miles long. The entry into a block was controlled by a signalman, with the siding at Abbots Ripton being called Block 4. The signals were interlocked with the points, meaning that if the points were open on the main line, then the siding signal would always be set to danger. The two signal boxes communicated with each other by block telegraph, and normally all signals were set to clear, which showed a white light. But when a train entered a section, the signalman would switch their home signal to danger, or red, so that another train can't enter the same block. He would also set the distance signal to danger as well. At the time, rules dictated that if a distance signal was set at danger, then a train may pass this signal, but they must be prepared to slow down for the home signal, which under no circumstances must they pass at red unless instructed it was safe to do so. This traffic light effect allowed for much smoother braking from high speeds and gave drivers forewarning that they may need to stop. Once the train had passed the block, he would then signal by block telegraph that the line was clear to the other signalman. In 1871, telephones had yet to reach the smaller signal boxes, so if the two signalmen needed to communicate, their only method available was Morse code senders. The signals used on the line themselves are in fact nearly the same set railway signals used on some lines in operation today. Called quadrant semaphores, these signals were operated by wires that ran through pulleys that were controlled by levers in the signal box. To set the signal to clear, the lever would be pulled and force the signal to move to the all clear position. This movement would bring the counterweight at the bottom of the signal pole up. A simple release of the lever would slacken the wire and gravity would force the counterweight down and the signal would jump back to danger. It's simple but very effective, as in an emergency and if the levers failed, then the signalman could simply cut the wires and the counterweight would do the rest. Cutting the wire though is not recommended and must only be done if all else fails. The wire is under a lot of tension and in some cases if the wire is cut or broken, it will release that tension quite forcefully, as one of my friends found out recently, as he was nearly catapulted across the signal box when a wire broke as he used the lever. The line itself was fairly straight, so when visibility is good, a simple check out of the signal box was enough to see that both the home and distance signals were in good order. At night, lamps were lit behind the signals and the lights would shine through the glass lenses of the signal. If the weather was especially bad, then the signalman could lay detonators by the signal, warning the train of the signal's presence. January 21st, 1876 was a bitter cold day. In the afternoon, a vicious snowstorm had hit the area, bringing freezing snow and large winds making visibility impossible. The snow settled on the freezing ground and froze the tracks and the points. It was a blasted day, and according to one, a storm they had never known before. At Peterborough, a slow goods train made its way onto the main line with its load of coal. The weather had made the train about 18 minutes late, but the weather was making it impossible for the train to make up for any lost time. 
At home, the signalman John Collins Osborne had just started his shift and knew that the train was late. So had planned to set the train in a siding at home so not to hold up the faster Scotsman's Express that would be coming through minutes later. John set the signal to danger but watched in horror as the train failed to stop. He telegraphed Abbott's Ripton to advise of the danger and that a train was in section without authorization. Meanwhile, at Abbott's Ripton, the signalman Charles William Johnson had flagged down the runaway train and began to move it into the sidings out of the way. The Scotsman, similar to her GNR Sterling, was well underway with little incident. It didn't slacken speed as it raced through the dark, wintry countryside before the home signalman could even react or put down detonators. It raced past the signal box. The levers at the home signal box were still set at danger, protecting now in vain the shunting of the coal train six miles away. At Abbott's Ripton, Charles could do nothing but watch as the express ploughed full speed into the coal train, which had yet to finish its shunt. The express derailed and lay broken on her side, and two of her carriages and tender obstructed the downline. The guards on the train were mostly unscathed by the accident and went to work straight away protecting the line from further trains. They walked along the line laying detonators, and it was thankful they did, as they managed to flag down the Manchester Express, who had followed the Scotsman and was stopped mere metres from the accident. Charles, who was in a state of shock at the events which had just unfolded outside his box, set both signals in both directions to danger. But in his panic, he forgot to send the 5 beta obstruction signal to Stuckey, which was the next signal south. Instead, he focused his attention on Huntingdon Station and sent the message with the code SP, meaning special message, indicating it was top priority. When the signalman answered, he replied with the code NQ, roughly translating to, go away, I'm busy. He was busy too, and the panicked, shocked signalman knew it. At that very moment, the Huntington signalman was accepting the Leeds Express and straight into the path of the crash. Unable to prevent the Huntington signalman waving through the Express, Charles finally sent the five beat obstruction code but it was seconds too late. As soon as the code was received, the Leeds Express had hurtled past the signal box at full speed. The Leeds Express hit the tender and the two felt carriages, adding to the already packed disaster. So just what had caused these trains to rush past the signals at danger? The inquiry concluded that there was no fault in John whatsoever. He had acted correctly, as did Charles, other than send the late obstruction signal in an attempt to stop the Leeds Express. There were faults on several others though, including the station master and the signalman at Huntington Station, who should have heeded Charles's messages. But all the drivers who gave testimony in the inquiry swore that all the signals were clear. In fact, both the signalman and the drivers were absolutely correct. What no one had realised is that ice and snow had accumulated on the signals and while they were normally set in the down position, when set to danger, the weight of the ice kept the signal down. Both signalmen would not have realised without a visual inspection and the drivers would not have known anything wiser. Other factors also contributed to the crash including the fact that none of the trains had slowed down due to the weather conditions, the failure to ask the plate layers nearby to put down detonators near signals, the lack of a speaking telegraph between signal boxes, and the Leeds Express not having continuous braking systems throughout its carriages, causing them to crash into one another. The Board of Trade who oversaw the inquiry made several recommendations. Although they had no enforcement power, the GNR and the railways took them all on board. These included improving signals to operate better in snow and if they fail, to have a system to alert the signalman. To keep all signals at danger, 
Even if there is no train in section, this way no false signals could be shown. The use of hand lamps by signalmen in bad weather to confirm signals. The provision of speaking telegraphs in all signal boxes. The provision of continuous braking systems on all carriages. And finally to suspend less important and impose speed restrictions on trains in bad weather. In all, 13 passengers died and 59 passengers were injured and it was one of the worst railway disasters of the time. The accident led to sweeping changes to the railway and signalling practices which are still in force today. A memorial to those who passed was erected shortly after the site was cleared but it was removed when the line was widened between 1885 and 1890. Today there is no marker at the site of the crash although there is rumoured to be part of one of the carriages kept at Hundingdon Station. However, this interior cannot be confirmed it is from the crash site. The crash was also the main inspiration for one of the most famous crashes to ever grace both paper and screen. In the railway series, Henry the Green Engine experiences one of the worst crashes to ever grace the island of Sodor when he pulls the flying kipper. The incident was supposed to write Henry out of the books for good. However, after children were concerned and wrote to Audrey about Henry's illness, he relented and rewrote Henry back in as a Stania Black 5 and used the incident as a suitable storyline to change the engine's shape and settle many arguments with his illustrators. The incident is still one of the most memorable moments in the entire series to date. The only known piece that did survive is this metal bar. The bar is most likely from the Scotsman's Express coaches, and although it's hard to say the exact part it was, the fact that it's bent showed the extreme stresses it must have had upon impact. The piece was collected by a local man called William Ayres and was kept in the Ayres family until his grandson donated the piece to the National Collection, where it remains to this day. It's an everlasting reminder to the 13 passengers who perished, and we're very lucky to have this for the future.